Alright, now that we've got astronomical science up and running, now we just need to do the exact same thing three more times. Next up, I'm gonna do energy science, and I'm gonna try and keep it in the same footprint as the previous build. We're also going to need thermofluid, but unlike everything else, I can actually copy that part of the design. Energy science requires a ton of these streams, which conveniently I've already got on trains. So pretty soon I've got all the fluids I'll be needing off to the side here. Then we'll bring in all the ten or so items that we'll need to build all the data cards. I'm not going to go over all the data cards because that would be extremely boring, but energy science requires a lot of the previous cards to make the more advanced ones as well. So even though I'm standardizing things to one manufactory each, I'm going to need several of certain buildings to match throughput. Also, most of the cards have extremely high failure rates. Entanglement data only has a 20% chance to actually make the card we want, and spits out a junk data card the rest of the time. So not only will we be needing multiple buildings to compensate for the failures, we'll also need to do a ton of card reformatting as well. This is already a giant mess, but that's what happens when you try and squeeze all the data cards in a confined space without any bots. I'm gonna be bringing in the enriched uranium by delivery cannon, since I've already got this whole place set up to deliver it to my other planets. All of the junk data cards and scrap will all go this way so they can be carried off by train or reformatted. And it's already getting pretty cramped in here, but I've already got half the data cards I'll need. The main difficulty is dealing with all the fluids, since the space underground pipes still only have a length of 5. Plus the need to cycle thermofluid means that pretty much every one of these buildings has both a fluid input and output. There's also these quantum processors I'll need a decent amount of, but they take one of the data cards and a lot of holmium. And it really hurts because we can't use productivity modules, we need to make them in space. Speaking of space, I'm running out of it. This is what I get for trying to be fancy with a symmetrical design. It doesn't help that half of the energy cards are made in these massive 9x9 particle accelerators. I've also got to use a lot of my precious space for the catalog production and the belts required to bring all the cards there. Since I need so many of these buildings to compensate for these cards' high failure rate, it's a bit of a squeeze. Energy science produces a lot of junk data cards. I'll probably need to come back and speed this up later, but for now it works. I can't actually make the fourth catalog yet, but with 12 out of the 16 data cards up, I can start making Energy Science 3. It is so nice that I made this whole science build in advance, since now all I need to do is insert the catalogs. And here comes our first Energy Insight. With this, now we can actually make significant data on the spot without needing to harvest it from that old crappy base. I was wondering why it wasn't making any science, and then I realized that I had the catalog belts reversed. Now it's working. The first thing I want to research are those quantum processors, since I'll need them to make Energy Science 4. Next we get quantum supercomputers and the fourth and final energy catalog. Now we can finally start making the last four cards. But first I'm going to upgrade these into quantum supercomputers. Not only are they faster, but they also have access to a more efficient reformatting recipe that breaks cards less often. Which is great because we're already backed up on junk data cards. It's also about this time that I realize that my science build is a little broken. At first I thought I needed to bring in blank data cards to make the insight, but as it turns out, making the significant data spits out so many blank data cards it's now clogged up. Well, I'll deal with that later. I've got this ultimate spaghetti to finish. Frankly, I'm shocked that I managed to fit this all in here. But thanks to the power of an unholy amount of underground belts, I've managed to maintain the design. Except I'm not actually done yet. I'm missing one last data card. Something called star probe data, which shockingly can only be found from launching a probe around a star. And seeing as we don't exactly have a star in our backyard, we're gonna need to make some spaceships. Since we've unlocked the ability to make our own ion thrusters, we can actually start making some useful ships. To launch the probe, we'll need a probe rocket silo. As well as the rocket itself. Next we'll need the payload, which is the actual probe. But before I get too deep into that, I fix this data card problem. Now the train takes away data cards instead of bringing them in. Since a probe takes a thousand data cards each, I've made a stop here to bring in blank data cards. Also, the sun's not the only thing we need to probe. The final tier of astronomical science requires an asteroid belt probe. I just didn't mention it because I was going to do them both at the same time. The spaceships work by using special floors and walls. Any fully enclosed space with a console in it is considered a spaceship. And we can actually completely automate launching and landing one.
Like any good engineer, the words fully automated gets me aroused. So obviously I've got to automate a ship that flies to the sun, gathers data, then flies back. Spaceship automation seems scary at first, but it's actually pretty straightforward. We use these clamps to determine where the ship will land and send signals into the console to tell it where to go and when to take off. Think of these combinators like a pre-flight checklist, like if we have full fuel and we need more data cards. Then only when they're all green does this combinator let the data in this constant combinator go into the console, which contains the launch signal and the destination. Put all that together and we're blasting off for the sun. I realize now that the clamp conditions at the top are needlessly complicated, but cut me some slack, this is my first spaceship. Since we're flying straight into the sun, these solar panels are more than enough to power the whole ship. I don't really know how I'm getting solar power inside of a spaceship, but I take what I can get. Also, it takes like 7 minutes real time to actually get this thing to the sun, so I'm using this time to set up the rest of the automation. Which is pretty simple, it just takes off and heads for Nalvis once we've got all the cards on board. And once we set up the clamp controller, the whole thing automatically lands. Obviously, I had to land it manually first to actually set up the clamp, but now that it's here, it's fully automated. With the silo up, we can pull the rocket and the payload from the buffer chests right below the console. This is a great use for buffer chests, because they can request things for themselves but also provide them to requester chests. Once it's back at Nalvis orbit, it'll automatically get refilled with probes and rockets. And there's our star probe data. Just watch it all get loaded into the ship. We launch a few more probes, and as soon as the Combinator realizes that we're all loaded up on cards, it's back to Nalvis orbit. Now that there's an underground belt, the cards automatically leave and get loaded on this train, which goes over here. I feel a little bad about needing to use a different station design because the other one wouldn't fit, but what you gonna do? The important thing is, now we finally have everything we need to make Energy Science 4. Well, we're one step closer to victory. You may remember that I need to probe an asteroid belt as well, but that's no problem. Since I've already built it once, I can just copy and paste it. After that, I just need to change some of the data around so it heads to an asteroid belt instead of a star. Then it's the same as the other one. I was actually worried that this number of solar panels wouldn't be enough to make it to the asteroid belt, but it's actually just barely enough. Since the further we get from the sun, the less effective they are. And welcome to the asteroid belt. You might recognize it. Set up the silo, grab the cards, and head back. Then that's everything we need for Tier 4 Astro Science. Well, that's two down. I guess I'll do Material Science next. Compared to Astro and Energy Science, Material Science barely takes any thermofluid, so I'm not gonna bother wasting Cryo Slush for the more efficient cooling recipe. Just this will be enough. Besides, it gives me extra space for other trains, and I'm gonna need a lot of them. Material Science is fairly straightforward, but it uses a lot of random things like trains and concrete. Most of all, pretty much everything takes Material Testing Packs. I've mentioned them before, but they are very inefficient to move around, so we're gonna be making them on site. I'll also be needing a handful of other fluids. Honestly, out of all the sciences, it probably takes the biggest number of different fluids. However, unlike Energy and Astro, we really only need one dedicated manufacturer for every different card, since it doesn't produce any junk data cards and all of the crafting times are essentially the same. The good news is, apart from lubricant, all of the weird fluids are only used in one card each. But for 6 out of the 16 cards, despite not taking in any cosmic water, they output tiny amounts of contaminated cosmic water, so we need to get rid of that. Thankfully, I just put it on a train and send it to my decontamination facility. There's a ton of little builds you need to get out of the way before you can really get into the meat of space science, but once you're there, there's really nothing stopping you. I didn't have room for my giant train yard, so I needed to make some room here. I understand that using a logistics bots to load a train when I could have just used the bots to bring the items directly to the manufacturer kind of defeats the purpose, but who cares. Behold, the train train. It's a train that carries trains. It's gonna take a while to saturate the belt, though. I haven't mentioned this yet, but scrap. Material science makes a lot of it, probably more than everything else combined. So much that I need three trains to take it all away. Thankfully, just like the contaminated cosmic water, I already have a place to deal with it. 
Another card recipe straight up requires plated space scaffolding, which I'm just making here and putting directly onto a train. It doesn't stop there with its weird ingredients. This one takes firearm magazines. This one also has a recipe that takes enriched uranium, so we're gonna do the same thing we did for energy science. Unlike Vanilla Factorio, we actually go through a pretty decent amount of uranium. Now there's only four more cards to go, except just like the others, I still can't make them yet. But that doesn't stop me from checking the recipes and setting them up anyway. And now I can just copy the supercomputer setup. Now we need to head back down to Nalvis to make something called Heavy Composite so I can make Tier 4 Science, since they're rather expensive to make and we want that productivity bonus. I didn't really leave any space for this, so I'm just squeezing it where it fits. Also, I'm 220 hours in, and I've kind of stopped caring as much. Hey, if it works, it works. Now we just need to load it on our big dumb mega train. And then as soon as we finish researching Material Catalog 4, we can finally start making the last tier of science. Ah, uh, look at the pretty colors on the belts. It wasn't nearly as impressive when we only had Astro Science going in. Although it does make you notice the one that's missing. That's right, biological science. I've been avoiding it for the past hundred hours, but I can't run away forever. The principal reason is because compared to the other three, it doesn't really unlock anything useful. At least not until you've finished all four tiers. Like, wow, extra inventory size. Whereas energy science gets you pylon substations and wide area beacons by tier two. The second reason is because compared to the other three, it's much more complicated which is mostly due to the fact that, unlike all the other sciences, bioscience requires you to make several intermediate products that are used exclusively in bioscience. Case in point, biosludge. It's pretty complicated, but it all starts here with this nutrient gel. One of the ingredients is methane gas, which fortunately I've already got on a rocket thanks to our time in Calidus Asteroid Belt. Another ingredient is biosludge, which might not make sense since we're building this to create biosludge, but we'll get to that. Thankfully, I have a little bit of bio sludge stored up in barrels, since it's a byproduct of decontaminating scrap, so we can seed the process. Now that we have nutrient gel, we can use it to make nutrient vats. Then I need to make this genetic data, which also consumes bio sludge. It also spits out contaminated cosmic water, so I gotta get rid of that too. Once we feed in some blank data cards, we've got genetic data. Bio sludge is used in pretty much every data card one way or another, except they also spit out contaminated bio sludge, so these will decontaminate that bio sludge and feed it back into the system. There's a small bit of contaminated scrap as a byproduct, but we'll just take that away. It's already pretty convoluted, but it gets worse. For the next step, we use the genetic data as well as the nutrient vats to create biocultures, as well as some vitamelange spice. It takes in 10 data cards and spits out 9, so we need to reinsert them. But we've got biocultures. What can we do with them? Well, we can create biomass. 15 out of the 16 data cards require biomass in some form, and all 16 require biosludge, which we can only get reliably by crushing biomass. Even though it takes biosludge to create biomass, if we crush it, we'll get more sludge out than we put in. But we don't want to fill our tanks completely, because if we did, there'd be nowhere for the newly cleaned biosludge to go, and then everything would get clogged up with contaminated biosludge. This whole loop from nutrient gel to biosludge is the bare minimum we need to fully automate the first tier of bioscience. You can see why I saved it for last. This is just me planning around stuff I can't even make yet, since I don't even have the first tier of bioscience yet. An issue which I aim to rectify shortly. Once you have all of the preliminary intermediates out of the way, it's actually not that complicated. It's not as easy as material science, but it's pretty comparable since you only really need one building for each card. The main issue, which is entirely self-imposed, is trying to squeeze managing all the waste fluids in this tiny space. But hey, we've got the first tier of bio cards. Getting the thermo fluid up there is a little annoying, but I manage. Our setup really isn't designed for the crappy insight recipe, so we jury rig some until we can get the next catalog researched. And now I can make experimental biomass. The problem with experimental biomass is that it also spits out normal biomass. 
So we gotta filter that off and route it back in. And now with the experimental biomass, we can get the next four data cards. This place is such a mess. All of my science builds are, but this one is definitely the worst. The junk data cards are starting to pile up, so I gotta reformat them. We don't get as many junk data cards as energy science, but we still gotta deal with them. I'm just gonna store the broken cards in a chest for now. Also, I can't actually make the next four data cards yet. I need vitalic acid. That means it's back down to now Vs. This is where I'm gonna put all the Vitamelange products. To make vitalic acid, we need sulfuric acid. Fortunately, there's a place to fit a train nearby. All we gotta do is combine that with Vitamelange extract, and we've got vitalic acid. Not much, though. One extract only gives you two acid. That doesn't sound so bad until you realize that it's a fluid, and that means it'll take 12,000 extract to fill a single storage tank. We'll also want to make bio scrubbers while we're down here, and those take vitalic acid, coal, steel, and glass, which is fortunately all nearby. These scrubbers are used to make the science, but for the data card, I need the acid on a train. I've been trying to avoid putting the space trains on the ground rails, but when it comes to getting fluid into orbit, there's really no better way. Now that I'm putting bio stuff here, these old cargo rockets are just in the way. They're practically historical artifacts at this point. And that's half the data cards out of the way. Now that we've got two catalogs up, we can actually make the biological insight normally. And now we get to see the significant data fully saturated with all four kinds of insight. It's the little things in Factorio. As it turns out, making only one unit of fluid per second is pretty slow, so I'm upgrading our Vitalic Acid build. Also while I'm down here, I'm setting up Vitalik Reagent for Tier 3 science. You might have started to notice that all of this is very hungry for Vitamelange extract. Especially considering we appear to be consuming a full blue belt of the stuff when our production is probably half of that. I'm sure it's fine. Now we need to make significant biomass, which uses some neural gel and that reagent we just made. Off topic, but I start to wonder why my vulcanite production is so low, and when I check I realize it's deadlocked in a weird way. As it turns out, this is the kind of design that can run perfectly for a hundred hours, then silently die. Alright, I just want to get bioscience over with. It's starting to get a little cramped in here. I can't even fit the trains normally anymore. This one takes advanced neural gel, which we need to make from significant biomass and a data card. Now the only thing I'm missing is Vitalik Epoxy, which takes an absolutely enormous amount of extract to make, 64 each to be precise. Even though I'm processing 8 lanes of nuggets, I'm still only getting half of a blue belt of extract. Turns out my extract production is horrifically underbuilt, so it's gonna be a while before I can even get any epoxy. An entire trainload of 20,000 extract got me like, a hundred. And it took like 20 minutes to get that trainload, but it's already gone in two. Well, I can actually get Bio 4 now, but not reliably. You might remember that rocket full of core fragments we made a while back. Well, finally we need it to make the fourth tier of bioscience. But only one each. This whole load will probably last me until the end of the game. But after so much pain and misery, we finally get Bio 4, which happens off screen because I wasn't paying attention. Now we can use the most efficient significant data recipe that uses all four insights. But regardless of shortages, there we have it, all four of the main sciences. Hard to imagine all these belts were completely empty 40 hours ago. So, now what? Well, it took us about 120 hours since we made the first one, but now we've got all 16 of the major space sciences, and that means it's time to do research. I'm going to focus primarily on spaceship integrity, which will allow us to build bigger and better spaceships, and if my assumptions are correct, we'll be needing them soon. It's also research that doesn't take any bioscience, so I can work on fixing my pathetic extract supply. I know last time I made a big deal out of not building Vitamelange processing on site, but now that it's come to this and I can just copy-paste the build from Nauvis, it's suddenly a lot more attractive. I just need to ship in some stone. This time we're just gonna burn all the excess wood. With my extract output mostly doubled, I can... 
With my extract output mostly doubled, I can finally start researching some of those bio upgrades. The most useful being intelligence, since it gives me 5% bonus productivity in my labs. But there is one other bio research I care about, and we'll get to that. For now I'm making a dirty setup for these superconductive cables. They're not really used in any science, but they're used in a lot of later buildings, so I figured I might as well start stockpiling them. And look how much I can fit in these thruster suit Mark III's. So you know what I hate? Biters. Not only do they attack my walls, but they also hog my precious UPS with their existence. Wouldn't it be great if we could just make them all go away? Well, now we can. Thanks to our biological research, we can now develop a plague that wipes out all life on a planet in a matter of minutes. And in the vacuum of space, there's no one there to prosecute you for war crimes. I think Taurus is a pretty good candidate for extermination, don't you? Shockingly, they don't seem to have taken too kindly to suddenly being infected with a deadly pathogen. I'm not sure I've ever seen them this pissed off. It seems like it's gonna take the plague a while to work its magic, but this is why we have orbital nukes. This is quite a lot of biters, though. I'm all the way down to 30 FPS. As far as I can tell, it's calling in every living biter in existence. After a while, the plague spreads to the south wall, but some of the biters are even dying before they get there. But that seems to be the last of them. Now I've got an even better idea. Let's Plague Rocket now, Vs. In return for killing all the biters, there is a small downside, and that is, from now on we'll need life support to walk on now, Vs. Plus all the trees and fish die, but that is a sacrifice I'm willing to make. With 30 FPS, and while everything on now, Vs is choking to death, I start setting up a train that takes stuff from now, Vs orbit and brings it down to now, Vs. Normally I'm doing the opposite, but there's a few things I need it for, namely higher tier modules, which all require things like data catalogs and machine learning data. It's just the same automatic requester design I've probably made five times this run. The end result is fully automated high tier modules, but I'm not going to go much past tier 6 because these things are ridiculously expensive. And I'm proud to announce that everything on Nauvis is finally dead. Now there's only one planet left we actually use that has biters on it, and that's our Vitimelange planet. Unfortunately, Vitimelange is an organic substance, so if you plague the whole planet it would kill all the Vitimelange as well. And I kind of need that stuff, so let's not do that. Now as it turns out, running the base at 100% for the first time is giving me quite the power problem. I've already got three gigawatt reactors, and I could add a fourth, but I'd much rather use this new research I just unlocked with all four tier 4 sciences. It requires a lot of parts though. Mostly a lot of weird stuff like heavy assemblies, nanomaterial, and high pressure vessels. It's a lot of random stuff that really isn't used much in science, so I'm just gonna make it over here. Thank you, logistics bots. I also need a ton more of these superconductive cables. When I saw they weren't really used in any science, I assumed I didn't need that many of them, but as it turns out, I need them by the thousands. So I'll be giving them their own dedicated crafting zone over here. The thermofluid is a little annoying, but I'm just going to leech it off of material science. Now we just gotta wait. By the way, not pictured are the several hours I spent revisiting old builds to help shore them up since I built them before I had wide area beacons. Also because after researching so much spaceship integrity, I've blown through all my stockpiles and my production can't quite keep up with my science demand. That's one of the challenges of this mod. Sometimes it takes a hundred hours before you figure out your production is insufficient. Now we'll need a spaceship, but I want one that can actually work without the sun, so we'll start with this circular design. Although three engines isn't much, so let's double it. I'm also going to need room to fit all the components, but not that much, so I'll keep it narrow. There we go, perfectly symmetrical and streamlined for optimal thrust. It's got its own reactor, but with only 8 turbines, its output is pretty limited. We also need to keep it supplied with water, but our condenser turbines can run for quite a while before it needs to be refilled. Anyway, I'm all stocked up with supplies and we're ready to go. I know I just put a lot of effort into making a ship that can fly without solar power just to fly to the sun, but we are about to solve my energy problem. Except this ship has a bit of its own energy problem. I guess I forgot that ion engines take 10 megawatts each. And those shield projectors aren't helping either. They're only 1 megawatt each, but whenever they block an asteroid, their power consumption goes way up. 
And so much for not relying on solar. But this is about as big as I can make the ship. I'll need to figure it out later. But here we are, back around the sun. The thing about the sun is, there's a lot of solar energy around it. About 15 times as much as there is on Nauvis. And that means getting several gigawatts of power for free up here is pretty trivial. One problem, all that power is trapped here and the place we need it is a couple million miles away. Well, with these power injectors and this one power beamer, we can solve that problem. This will give us the ability to shoot 13 gigawatts of raw power wherever we need it. And where we need it just so happens to be now Vs. We can catch the beam with this receiver and turn that heat into steam with these high temperature heat exchangers. But not just any steam, 5000 degree steam, which can only be used by these high powered steam turbines. They put out one gigawatt each. That's right, just one of these is equivalent to my entire 8 reactor blueprint. It also returns 99% of the water used, but it spits out some 500 degree steam that we need to burn off with regular turbines. This whole thing puts out 4 gigawatts, which is already double my power grid. I don't think I'm going to be having energy problems anytime soon. So that gets me thinking. The reactor in my spaceship really, really sucks. But what if I used another beam receiver inside the ship? And in spite of shooting 12 gigajoules of concentrated solar energy at the roof of my spaceship, it works. It's about the same size as the old reactor, except instead of putting out 40 megawatts, it puts out 560. Although, the beam doesn't seem to work in transit, but it can store so much heat energy it's hardly a problem. Now I can actually use all my engines with power to spare. Now that we've got a spacecraft capable of interstellar travel, we're almost ready to enter the final stage of the game, which lies in these asteroid fields deep in space, which can only be found with research. There is a resource inside of them called Naquiite. It has a mining time of 1000 and requires 2 sulfuric acid every mining operation. Obviously with a mining time like that, we want a field as big as possible, but even out here, it's rare, and finding the right asteroid field takes a lot of effort and expensive research. You might find a field filled with naquite only for it to be 50 minutes away, while all your nearby fields are as barren as, well, space. Now at this point, I'm going to give you a fair warning that if for some reason you want to tackle this behemoth yourself, from now on, there's going to be spoilers. And that's because, in our quest to find asteroid fields, our telescopes picked up something else. So obviously we gotta go check it out. And then we get some sort of message. Hmm, so some ship came to this anomaly and exploded. Apparently we can pick up these broken pieces. And we can put it back together. Uh-huh. Well, it seems to get any further, I'll need some Naquium processors, which I don't have. Although, there is something up here. I guess this is the ship that exploded and probably took out the ring with it. There's not too much to say about it, seeing as it's all broken, but there are some things we can salvage, like these Naquium solar panels, accumulators, and more of these deep space belts. Well, clearly we can't get any further without those Naquium processors, so it's time to leave. As much as I'd like to go grab some Naquiite right now, we've got a problem. A rather serious beryllium shortage. Remember our asteroid base that makes beryllium and how I mentioned that because it can't use productivity modules it makes half as many ingots as it should? Well, it makes half as many as it should. So instead of building it in space to make a point, I'm gonna build it on the ground like a sane individual. Author has raw barrel, water, and while it might not have oil, it's got enough coal to at least supply the small amount of sulfuric acid we'll need. However, the old power plant isn't quite up to snuff, so we'll need to replace it with the gigawatt design if we want to make both cryonite and beryllium. As for the sulfuric acid, I'm just going to copy the same coal liquefaction design from Verb Tea. It is way overbuilt for what we actually need, but just copying it wholesale is way easier than scaling it down. Also, we'll just feed the sulfuric acid with logistics bots. Now for the actual beryllium processing. You've seen me build this all before, so here it is just with ground manufacturers instead of the space ones. Building this stuff on the ground is much nicer. Those ginormous space buildings might be fast, but they're a pain to build around. Even if it weren't for the whole no productivity thing, I'd still want to build everything on the ground. But here they are, beryllium ingots. All filled up with productivity modules like they should be. Load them all on a rocket, and our beryllium production is officially fixed. 
As expected, this base with the same four belts of raw barrel as input easily makes twice as much as our asteroid belt base. Lesson learned, space sucks. Nature is healing. My factory, uh, not now Vs, I covered that in a plague. So this is the closest asteroid field with a majority of Naquiite, but it's pretty far away. It's over 30 minutes away with our current ship, so we're gonna need to go somewhere else. For now. Dead space is a fourth as far, and at least has some Naquiite. Actually, there's a better asteroid than this. There we go. It's pretty tiny, but it's still the best we're gonna get. Don't forget we need this sulfuric acid to actually mine it. There is absolutely no solar out here, but our spaceship can give us all the power we need. Raw Naquiite stacks to 10, which isn't a lot. But not only that, we need four of them to make one crushed Naquiite. So obviously we want to crush it on site, except it takes iridium plates and occasionally spits out iridium powder. Okay. Crushed Naquiite stacks to 20 though, so by crushing it here we can bring back about 8 times as much. Seeing as we're in deep space, transporting it by spaceship is pretty much our only option. Cargo rockets do work here, but it's like 500,000 rocket fuel per rocket, and there's no way we could get that much fuel reliably on site. Well anyway, welcome to the part of the game where I stand around waiting for a box to fill up. Until I run out of sulfuric acid, I'm stuck here. Fifteen minutes later, the sulfuric acid's all dry, and we start shoving the crush wherever it fits. That one tank seems to have gotten us about half of a warehouse, or about 10,000 crush, which isn't much, but it's a start. And after another nine minutes of flying, we're finally back with our first load of Naquiite. Now that we've got the Naquiite, we actually need to do something with it, and that starts with this tiny spaceship here. In order to process Naquium, we'll need beryllium hydroxide. We already make it in two places, but neither of them are here, so we need to go get it. I'm going to drain it from the asteroid belt, since it's closer and it means I don't need to land and take off from another planet, which requires a ton of fuel. Naquium processing is the final boss of all the material chains. It requires a bunch of random stuff like beryllium hydroxide and vitalic acid. The recipe that takes cation ion exchange beads spits out anion beads and vice versa. It also spits out holmium chloride and beryllium powder occasionally as well. But the real kicker is we need both refined and powdered naquiite in different amounts, but both recipes spit out some of the other. That means if we run out of powder and back up on refined, it would be impossible for the powder recipe to get rid of its refined byproduct and the whole thing would deadlock. The solution is, as always, a priority input splitter. As long as we prioritize the byproducts as input into the main line, it'll clear that first before using up the output from the main recipe. The naquiite crystals are fairly straightforward in comparison, but the recipe spits out all three of its inputs as output. But again, as long as we prioritize the byproducts, it'll all just work. It also uses vitalic reagent, which is even more demand on vitamelange. It's about this time that I randomly look at Nauvi's orbit and happen to see the bones of about a million rockets scattered around. <laughs> what happened here? I don't know when it happened, but for some reason the cargo supply rocket for the asteroid belt is set to Nauvi's orbit. And now that there's zero cargo sections on the asteroid belt, the rocket circuits are trying to send an endless amount of cargo sections that will never arrive. When you get this far into the game, you kind of take for granted that there's this constant logistical ballet of rockets going on 24-7. And when it messes up even slightly, this happens. Where was I? Right, the ingots. They're pretty easy to make, they just take all three of the previous recipes. And just like all the other ingots, we need pyroflux. Except this time we also need methane gas. At least it gives us something to do with the methane byproduct of the vitamelange processing. And seeing as this stuff is pretty hard to get, we want to fill everything with the best productivity modules we can manage. It took about 15 hours stockpiling extract to make this many, but it's worth it. This whole thing might seem overbuilt considering I only have enough raw naquiite to run this thing for like a minute tops, but in spite of how hard it is to get, I dream to one day have a steady, fully automated supply of the stuff. The important thing is, we have access to naquium now. Except we're gonna need a lot more of it. So it's back to the spaceship, which I've retrofit to have even more sulfuric acid. Each tank of sulfuric acid is enough to fill about half of a warehouse, so this should get us around three warehouses full of crushed naquiite. All that's left to do now is wait until they drain. And then an alarm goes off, warning me that there's too much wood clogging up vitamelange. I'm stuck out here so I can't really deal with it, but I have my ways. Mm, yeah, the bots will fix it. It's like it never even happened. 
In spite of that brief stint of excitement, the tanks still have a third to go. After two hours of standing around and doing nothing, I've managed to fill the ship. After a lot of running back and forth to unload it manually, I add in some requester chests and buffer chests to make it semi-autonomous. I still need to fly and land it manually, but at least I don't need to strand myself with it anymore. Except I forgot to reactivate the engine. Well, that was stupid. With three full warehouses and a ship on its way to get more, it's finally time to start putting this Naquium to good use. I'm talking about deep space science, the final frontier of space exploration. Now, one of the data card recipes takes an entire ion canister as an ingredient to make a single card. That's 1,000 ion stream each, plus a magnetic canister. So before I can even start on the others, I'm going to take care of that by just copying my existing stream area and repurposing it to make nothing but ion stream. Then I need to make the magnetic canisters and load the finished ion canisters onto a train. Alright, so I'm going to build the deep space science zone all the way at the top of our base. Even though it's the final tier of science, our goal is pretty much the same. Make 16 different cards to turn into 4 different catalogs. And just like all the others, we'll need some thermo fluid. Before I even start, I'm getting the whole catalog area set up. That way I can just feed all the cards down here as I finish them. The first thing I'll need is some nanomaterial. And you can tell the mod's been wearing me down because I'm using a requester chest to bring in the dynamic emitters instead of using only belts. I never said that using only belts was a requirement, okay? Still, I feel like I've lost some of my integrity. The first tier of deep space science isn't that complicated, all things considered. This one takes nanomaterial and randomly spits out some garbage, but I'll just be shoving that into an active provider chest and letting the bots handle it. Then there's the previously mentioned recipe that takes an entire ion canister, and the one that just takes a naquium ingot and some lube. That's three of them, but where's the fourth? Well, just like Astro and Energy, we need probe data, except from an asteroid field this time. While that guy's off doing that, I hand supply some of the naquium we've managed to scrounge together. As soon as the probe data arrives, we'll have the first catalog. So to make the actual science, we'll need naquium plates, which are a little bizarre because they take an iridium bearing, which I'm going to be supplying with logistics bots. There is no deep space insight. Instead, we'll need advanced neural gel from our bioprocessing to make all the deep space sciences. Other than that, it's just catalog, significant data, and increasingly advanced Naquium products. And my probe data has arrived. Now we have everything we need to make the first tier of science. The deep space catalogs can only be made in neural supercomputers. They also take these crinite rods, but fortunately I can squeeze them in using belt weaving. And there it is, but we shouldn't get too excited seeing as Naquium isn't even automated yet. Although this is a major step forward, and that's because I've got my eyes on antimatter reactors and antimatter engines, as well as factory spaceship, which gives us 500 spaceship integrity each. Altogether, all that research will take about 5 to 7,000 science, but seeing as I have almost 100% productivity in my labs, we can cut that number in half. And even though it's not automated, our current ship should be up to the task. Now it's time to stand around and wait for research to finish. Okay, so shockingly to actually use antimatter reactors, we need antimatter, and that starts with these material fabricators. They are ridiculously expensive to produce, taking 5 tier 6 speed and efficiency modules. Also, they require like 200 megawatts to run. To actually make the antimatter, we just need to combine some particle stream with a ton of supercooled thermofluid. The uh, pipes here are a bit of a mess. We'll also need to put some antimatter in canisters. These are going to be pretty important. With this last shipment of raw naquiite, we should have enough to finish all the research we need. I'm also going to need some of these naquium cubes, which are also made in material fabricators. The weird thing about fabricators is they have zero module slots and aren't affected by beacons whatsoever, so a crafting speed of 4 is the best you're ever going to get. There's no way to reduce the power demand, either. With engines and reactors done, I can finally start building a real spaceship. 
That old ship we found never was very useful, and now it's in the way. Sentimentality is dreadfully inefficient, so I strip it down for parts to make room for the next generation. Seeing as we can automate a spaceship to gather data cards, it stands to reason that we could automate gathering naquiite as well. The only issue is, instead of being two minutes away, our destination is 40 minutes away, and devoid of any solar power. Well, with our new engines, we can cut that down to 20 minutes, and with our new reactors, we can provide 400 megawatts without needing to resort to the energy beam shenanigans. To bring our naquiite back, we're going to need a lot of storage space if we want to fit enough to justify a 40 minute round trip and it's going to need a lot of defenses to maintain the higher speeds, but after some effort, I've got a usable hauler design. And now that we've finished the second level of Factory Spaceship, we can actually fly it. You may be wondering, why am I bringing Bio Sludge instead of Sulfuric Acid? Well, all will be revealed shortly. Antimatter reactors consume antimatter canisters, and they will keep consuming them at an alarming rate even if there's no energy demand. So making a circuit condition to only add more fuel if steam is below a certain level can be the difference between your fuel lasting 5 minutes or 5 hours. And when you're in deep space 20 minutes away from any hopes of resupply, you're gonna prefer the latter. I take it out for a quick whirl around Mariel to show that this hulking behemoth can actually land and take off. Antimatter has 10 times the energy density of rocket fuel, so what would have taken us 7 tanks filled with 320,000 units of rocket fuel, we can do with only 1 tank and 32,000. I decided I could use a little bit more thrust though, so I add this. Can't forget to stock up on iridium plates. And I'm bringing some water ice as well. It's finally time to automate some naquium. Except we're not taking the spaceship, we're taking a cargo rocket with 3 quarters of a million units of rocket fuel. It's not really feasible in the long term, but it gets us there instantly. All we really need to do is set up some mines, but when you're all the way out here, it becomes quite an ordeal. The first thing we set up is where we're gonna crush it. You've already seen this before, except this time we're making it a little bigger. While I'm doing that, my assistant starts setting up a nuclear power plant. He gets the ratios wrong, but forgive him. The next thing we need is a train stop. I'm gonna make the train six wagons long, because ten items in a stack isn't much. After 20 minutes, the spaceship finally gets here. Unfortunately, I need to reverse this. In the meantime, my other assistant has been setting up Naquium mines. And thus begins the task of connecting them all to the rail network. The good news is, once I designed one station, I just need to copy and paste it. We're gonna need more mines than just that, though. Four mines is probably enough. Also, we'll need this iron for the sulfuric acid and nuclear fuel. We'll also need this methane. Now on to actually making the sulfuric acid. As it turns out, there's a recipe that uses bio sludge and methane gas to create crude oil. Not much use elsewhere, but here it lets us bring one tank of bio sludge instead of 12 tanks of sulfuric acid. Just bringing sulfuric acid is definitely easier though, but when have I ever done something just because it was easy? And there it is, sulfuric acid. And now there is nothing stopping us from getting that sweet, sweet naquiite. It's gonna take a while to fill this beast up, though. And one hour later, we're back on Nauvis. As you can see, the bots are automatically refilling all of the water ice and iridium plate chests. Speaking of automatically, time to automate it. And when you have a ship capable of landing on Nauvis, why not land on Nauvis? From here, once the ship sees its cargo is empty, it sets off back to the asteroid field to get more. Then when it detects it's full again, heads back to Nalvis orbit, refuels and loads up on ice and plates, and then it's back down to Nalvis. It's all one big glorious circle of automation. So that's nice, but it still takes about an hour for the complete round trip. Except now that I've got one hauler working, there's nothing stopping me from just slamming down two more. These things work right out of the box. No need to edit the combinators or anything, just send it off and it's good to go. My antimatter production kind of sucks though. 
It's not nearly enough to supply three ships and their reactors, and the main culprit would be my complete underestimation of how much supercooled thermofluid I could create in this space. The main problem is, I didn't use Crynite Slush, which makes it about four times as effective. Well, I rebuild it somewhere else, and now it makes about four times as much. You wanna know what's really annoying? Crashing rockets can occasionally take out belts and won't leave a ghost behind so they can be automatically repaired, which means it can completely kill production for literal dozens of hours until you notice. I'm only a little mad. Alright, with a steady supply of Naquium secure, there is nothing stopping us from making the second tier of Deep Space Science. The first two data cards are pretty straightforward, but then there's the two that take data cards from other sciences. Anomaly in particular is a mess. Not only does the recipe take in data cards and spit them back out, but the recipe is also super slow, meaning we'll need several manufactories. The easiest solution I've found is to just shove it all in the same warehouse with some limits on the input and sort it out that way. We'll need some Naquium cubes on a train to make the second tier of Deep Space Science, but here it is. Remember those super fast belts we scavenged here and there? Well now we can make them ourselves. We can even color code them too, and for some reason I decide to replace every belt in the science zone with the appropriate color. Also, in a fit of mod-induced madness, the old base has become deeply offensive to me, so I decide to blow it up. There we go, it's like it never existed. I don't know what that accomplished, but I feel better now. This was mostly because I've been avoiding the next step. Arcospheres. They're what's separating me from the last two tiers of science, and they're a doozy. To get them, we're going to need a spaceship, and considering my other ship designs, I'm gonna make this one one big ball, cause it gets spheres, obviously. We collect them just like probe data, but instead of getting data, we get arcospheres instead. Four if we're lucky, and probably closer to one per launch on average. Plus, launching too many collectors in the same field makes you less likely to get more, so it should be obvious that these are pretty hard to get. However, unlike everything else, arcospheres are never consumed, only transformed. First we need to polarize them, which spits out one-third of the Greek alphabet, labeled Lambda, Xi, Zeta, Theta, Epsilon Phi, Gamma, and Omega. Feels like I'm back in physics class. Here is all four data cards we need for the next tier of science. Not only do they transform the spheres, but the recipe actually vacillates between spitting out the spheres labeled X1 and the ones labeled X0. You should also realize that the spheres it spits out are nothing like the spheres it takes in. In fact, here's what happens if we just let this thing run. And it's deadlocked. I added this numerical display so you can see what happened. All of our spheres have now concentrated into Lambda, Zeta, and Epsilon. The only way to handle this is by using one of ten folding recipes. All they do is turn two types of spheres into two different spheres. At least their output is consistent. The puzzle here is how to detect when you've got too many or too few of an arcosphere. There's a couple ways to do it, but I've opted to use bots and circuits. This logistics network here is separate from the rest of the base and only moves arcospheres. The yellow chests are filtered to only one kind of sphere and they're moved around with requester chests. Also, the output spheres are automatically sorted using the active provider chests. The hard part is knowing what and when to fold. I haven't figured out how to do that yet, but I do know how to make it only fold a certain recipe when it receives a certain signal. And I accomplish that by using a constant combinator which holds the spheres required for that recipe as a signal, which is only allowed to pass when the folding request comes in. Then that's passed to the arithmetic combinators that isolate the sphere signals and feed that into a requester set on set requests mode. And then the bots will automatically bring in the requested spheres when the fold request comes through. It helps to do what you know first. It makes the whole problem feel a little less overwhelming. And while you're focused on one part, you might suddenly think up the solution, like I did. We can't just detect when one sphere is too high because they can only be folded in pairs. But that just means we need to treat them like pairs. If we make a circuit for each recipe that takes into consideration the input and the output, we should be able to balance it. For example, if we read the data from our chests and add the number of Lambda and Omega Arcospheres together, then add the number of Xi and Theta Arcospheres together, we'll be able to see if the input spheres are greater than the output. Meaning, if we folded that recipe, we would subtract 2 from the input and add 2 to the output, reducing the difference between them and bringing it closer to being balanced. If we repeat that for every recipe and add a constant to the equation so it won't try to balance even when the difference is only 1, then it should just work. 
I added some lamps so you could see which recipe was trying to fold. But theoretically, all I need to do is plug that into the part I already made and see if it balances. And, uh, yeah, seems pretty balanced to me. There were a few errors I had to iron out, but it seems to work. Good job, me. Or not. Actually using the sphere seems to be a different story. I question my design, but it seems that with the cards running, I just don't have enough leftover spheres to fold at the same time. So while I'm getting more spheres, I make some adjustments. I added the Naquium Tesseracts and a circuit condition so the inserters only insert if all the spheres were present. I was having issues with three of one sphere getting stuck inside each machine without a mate. It still occasionally likes to get imbalanced, but it's nothing a badness detector can't fix. All it does is stop the inserters on the non-balancing recipes if the numbers are way off. I could just stand here watching this forever, though. But I've got a video to finish. The good thing about Deep Space Tier 3 is once you figure out the Arco Spheres, the rest is basically free. There isn't much we can actually do with it, apart from researching Tier 4. Yay! Tier 4 is also pretty easy, seeing as it also mostly takes Arco Spheres. Basically, my advice is make sure your Arco Sphere setup works. But while I'm researching the final catalogs, one of my haulers runs out of fuel for some reason. No idea how this happened, but that means I need to fly there, cobble together this thing to actually get the antimatter fluid out of the canisters, and then fly back. Easily a waste of 50 minutes. Back in orbit, I set up the Naquium processors and the almost final three data cards. The hypergraph data requires a deep supercomputer, which is insanely expensive to make. There is one data card we're missing, however. Interstellar travel data. And that can only be obtained from powering a Nexus in a super-fast ship during interstellar travel. This thing takes a ton of power. This orb ship isn't even powerful enough to make any data. The faster you go, the more power it takes, but the faster you make data. The good news is, one card is enough to make eight science packs, so you don't need a crazy amount of this stuff. After about 40 minutes of flying, I get about 2,500 cards, which is about 20,000 science. Or 40,000 when you factor in our lab productivity. Since these cards go so far, I'm not really gonna bother automating them. But that is every science completed. Hooray. With this, victory is in our grasp, but it's still farther away than you'd think. At this point, all I really need to do is wait for research to complete, but it's times like this when a base really shows its cracks. Even though I thought I was building robustly, some things you never anticipated sneak through. Somehow I lost the first part of this footage, but Hothir, my only source of cryonite and main source of beryllium, was completely dead because of one small oversight. When I added the beryllium production, I just used a requester chest to bring in iron plates for sulfuric acid and completely forgot that our only source of iron was a core mining drill, which was ever so slightly insufficient. And after like 50 hours, we ran out of iron plates to make fuel cells for the nuclear power plant and everything died. Here is what I did catch on camera. Core fragments somehow got mixed on the belt and clogged up the crushers since they look almost identical to raw cryonite. I didn't notice it first, I just thought they were being slow. This meant that there was no cryonite, and no cryonite meant no holmium, and no holmium meant no energy science as well as a myriad of other things. But no energy science mostly means a massive delay in our game-winning research. Also, after another 50 hours or so, vulcanite broke again. I really should fix it, but I'm pretty sure I'm gonna win within the next 50 hours. And this was basically my life, looking around for random things that broke. If I went into all the little tweaks I had to do, this video would be three hours long. With Spaceship Victory almost researched, you'd think we'd be close, but we're not. Even if we can win, we don't have a ship powerful enough to do it, and that's gonna take even more levels of factory spaceship. This is also when I realized my production of quantum processors was horrifically insufficient and only seemed fine because it had been building up a buffer for literal days. What I'm trying to say is, I have a shortage of everything, but at this point in the game it's easier to just wait than trying to add more production. So in the spirit of killing time, I start looking at some other planets. And find a whole lot of nothing. The only planets worth looking at already have a pyramid or a ruins tag on it. But here's one with ruins on it, and I made this Giga Thrust spaceship to get us there. It's actually crazy how effective this engine setup is, but even so, it's gonna take us 25 minutes to get there. It's certainly an interesting looking place. It's even got some free arcospheres. And a ton of fish. As far as I can tell, the only utility of coming here is some free arcospheres. But I guess space tourism is fine too. Well, not much more to do here, so we're off.
Well, there's one more ruin to look at. The difference is, this one is aggressive. But so are we. Hmm, acceptable loss. Less acceptable loss. Well, eventually we get inside, and it's just a bunch more Arcospheres. But I'm not saying no to them. That killed some time, and we have all the research we need. So to actually win, we need to maintain 6 gigawatts at 250 speed for 10 whole minutes. And considering all the asteroids we'll need to defend at those speeds, we'll need more like 7 gigawatts. In spite of my best efforts, this bollular design can't house all the thrust we need. Also, the power generation gets clogged up with water. So it's back to the drawing board. This one will have a much more robust reactor design. Also, with these giant gigawatt turbines, I've realized that each one needs its own dedicated pipe for water drainage so it doesn't get clogged. And I'm basically going to copy the thruster design from the other ship. Put all that together, and we should have a game winner. This one's pretty thick, though. We just barely meet our maximum hull stress, but it's got plenty of thrust. It's actually got too much thrust, so I need to tone it down a bit. But one way to find out if it works, we start the countdown. And after 30 seconds, she seems to be holding steady. So all that's left to really do is wait and remember the good old times. Except I wasn't done yet. There's another way to beat space exploration. Remember that big ring we found a while back? Well, now we have everything we need to repair it. But first, we're going to want to research this teleportation tech. Soon followed by this Arcolink storage research. And this thing is pretty interesting, I tell you what. For starters, it's the only thing in the game that consumes Arcospheres. We're going to need two of these, and that means saying goodbye to 20 of our precious space balls. But trust me, they're worth it. So Arcolink storage is exactly that. They're linked chests. Put something in one, and you can take it out from the other. But they need to be placed on the same surface to be linked. That may sound useless until you realize that you can place it on a spaceship and retain its link. Suddenly, you can transport items from your base immediately across time and space and to your spaceship. Let me tell you, this is invaluable for what we're about to do. And so naturally, using the exact same automatic item request design I've built at least four times this run, I can request anything I want and have it automatically teleported from Nauvi's orbit and into my ship. So it's about time we visited that ring again. With everything I need just one request away, repairing this thing should be no problem. And there it is. Now you have to wonder what we actually do with it. Apparently it's trying to consume 10 gigawatts, which is a bit more than I can make, but I guess getting that much is a start. With the main supply of my entire base firmly at my fingertips, even all the way out here, building a 10 gigawatt reactor is no big deal. We can bring in fuel and water too. Alright, let's turn this baby on. Hmm. I can spin it around. Gate tried to draw more power than available. Hmm. Seems to have wanted 20 gigawatts. Also, there appears to be input for supercooled thermofluid. Well, when I power it up now, all these lights are green, so that's a step in the right direction. I wonder about the other two rows, though. 
Well, the bottom row seems to come from activating the mechanisms without running out of power. I guess we need more power then, even though this is already more than my entire base uses. Okay, here we go again. Well, that's one locked in, and it's consuming 20 gigawatts consistently. Are you kidding me? These things take 10 gigawatts each. I need to build a 90 gigawatt reactor. Well, that's a good thing I've got a decently supplied base, but it's not like these reactors are cheap. That's 500 superconductive cables each. Only five more to go. I don't think I even need to say anything. I think this speaks for itself. Now let's push all the buttons. Except that one doesn't work for some reason. But this one does. Alright, so we're consuming 90 gigawatts and all the lights are on, but nothing's happening. That must mean we gotta deal with the top row of lights. I almost forgot about this random research we uncovered by coming here. Uses a star's gravity well as a stabilizing point for spatial anomaly, huh? And a 60 gigawatt power requirement, huh? So apparently I need to place this thing around a sun, so here I am at Calidus. And the solar array that powers my entire base is giving me about a fifth of what I need. I guess I'm going to be needing a few more of these Naquium solar panels. Okay, so this one square of solar panels makes about 6 gigawatts, meaning I'll need 9 more of them. It's a good thing I have a hearty supply of Naquium. I'm gonna need to turbocharge my scaffolding production, though. And there it is, our solar anchor thingy. And now if we check the wheel, we can see one light has... Okay, so we need to do that seven more times around seven different suns. The good news is we can blueprint it. The bad news is each one of these takes 46,000 scaffolding. Thankfully, while I amass scaffolding, I find something to distract me. This weird spider Tron wants me to play his game. Hmm, interburbal. Basically, we need to enter a 3D vector that intersects the highlighted cell on the given grid, which is no problem if you remember your vector math. I turn it into a Python script and flawlessly beat every puzzle. What does this have to do with anything? Who knows. Back to making dimensional anchors, I guess. While I'm here, I take a quick picture of a nearby ruin. And here I am around another sun. And again. You get the idea. Let's skip to the last one. And this doesn't even include the time that it takes to fly from star to star. But that combined with looking inside every pyramid I found along the way made me roughly keep pace with how long it took me to make the materials for each anchor. Alright, now what's our reward for all of that effort? Now all the lights are green, so what happens if we do this? The distortion is unstable, and doesn't lead anywhere. Mm, yes, getting this far you have earned the privilege to do the actual puzzle. Remember all those pyramids we've been seeing? Well, the answer lies in those. There's 60 of them in total, and I've hit maybe half of them. If you want any hope of solving the puzzle, I recommend you find all of them. Fly to a planet, take a picture, and repeat ad nauseum. Then once you have all of them, you can actually start trying to solve the puzzle, which is probably harder than everything you've done just to get this far, and it involves looking really, really hard at all of these until you notice the patterns and with a bit of wild intuition, start deciphering how the damn dial works. I'm not going to give away the answers, but I will say that there's a reason that that one glyph wouldn't lock into the first chevron to the left of the console. Basically, what we're trying to do with this Stargate is to figure out how to translate the eight different symbols into a certain 3D vector. So once you think you know how it works, you can start feeling out some test variables to build your model. And if you're really dedicated, you can solve it mathematically. But don't solve it mathematically, because that's what I did, and it took way longer than just charting points and eyeballing where your target vector is. Well, I say I solved it, but my two companions actually have a higher education than me, so it was really a group effort. And don't feel bad if you can't figure it out on your own. 
Also, the solution is randomized every run, so don't bother trying my combination. But with enough effort, you'll eventually be rewarded with this. Well, that was anticlimactic. I guess since I already got the victory from the spaceship, I don't get it again here. Oh well, a win's a win. And that's the end of space exploration. First, I'd like to thank my two helpers for wasting their valuable time helping me, and you, the viewer. Now I know what you're thinking. If he can do this, what else is he capable of? Well, here is a list of people who have recognized that threat and have decided to pay me tribute. If you want the save file for this run, it's gonna be on my Patreon. What a ride. At this point, if you haven't subscribed yet, I don't know what I can do. This whole run had its ups and downs and was an absolute monster of an undertaking. But here we are, after five months, finally at the end. If you've made it this far with me, congratulations. I'll see you next time.